I have several questions I would like to ask you, which only you can answer. Please answer to yourself in your mind, either yes or no. No maybes, no sometimes, no, well, more often than not, just yes or no. This is a test of your integrity. Question number one, do you keep your word? Question number two, when you're in the great minority, do you have the guts to stand alone regardless of the consequences? Question number three, when someone gives you a job to do, do you complete it without supervision? Without expecting applause? Question number four, do you pay all of your bills on time? Number five, if an investigation of your life were conducted, would you be free of fear? Number six, if you saw a wallet lying on the floor in the shopping aisle of your local grocery store, no one else is in the aisle, you observe that the wallet has in it $400 and a number of credit cards, would you immediately turn it in at the customer service counter without taking anything out? Number seven, as you're leaving a shopping mall late one evening, you back into another car accidentally, causing a fair amount of damage. No one else is in the parking lot. It's dark. No one else saw the accident. Would you leave your name and a way the person can reach you so that you might pay for the damage. I have never seen you so quiet in all my years. That's good. That's a good thing. It means you're thinking. All of those questions relate to your integrity. They have to do with your inner character. Two words rarely used these days, seldom if ever in the public square, character and integrity. Because integrity is not that clearly understood, it seemed to me the place to begin is to define it. Allow me a little time at the risk of being tedious with the definition. Oxford's English Dictionary, the final authority on definitions, tells us the word comes from the Latin integritas, I-N-T-E-G-R-I-T-A-S, integritas, which means wholeness, completeness. Webster's Collegiate Dictionary goes a little further with amplifying the definition telling us it means soundness, a firm adherence to a code or standard of values, the state of being unimpaired is an old fashioned term for all of this, honest to the core. A person with integrity is not divided. That's called duplicity. A person with integrity is not phony and does not pretend. That's called hypocrisy. A person with integrity has nothing to hide and nothing to fear and lives her or his life welcoming scrutiny. Let me go a little bit further as I work carefully on clarity. When you have integrity, you are verbally responsible 
you do not lie ever you tell the truth when you are a person of integrity you are financially responsible you handle your money and others appropriately you are accountable a person of integrity is privately pure. There is no double life. You don't live one way and talk another way. Your public and private triangles are congruent. Integrity works itself out in various ways. Ethical soundness, meaning you won't cut corners intellectual veracity meaning you will not cheat or take some other's work and claim it as your own which is called plagiarism you will also live a life of moral excellence you don't live with the fear of being found out there's nothing to find out you are living a life of personal consistency. There is no difference whether you are alone or a whole room of people would be watching you. You are the same. I've always appreciated the prayer of Fred Holloman while he was chaplain of the Kansas Senate. He offered this straightforward prayer before the Senate. Omniscient Father, Help us to know who is telling us the truth. One side tells us one thing, the other just the opposite. And if neither side is telling us the truth, we would like to know that too. If each side is telling us half the truth, give us the wisdom to put the right halves together. In Jesus' name, amen. It's a great prayer. It needs to be offered in places of high authority in our day, where reputation is running thin and lies are rampant. There are some scriptural statements that reveal the benefits of integrity. Look quickly, will you? Mainly in Proverbs. And though the words integrity is woven through the fabric of the Bible, let me have you look in Proverbs uh, just for the sake of time. Chapter 10, verse 9. People with integrity walk safely, but those who follow crooked paths will slip and fall, says this version of the Bible. Proverbs 11, 3. Another word for integrity, honesty guides good people, dishonesty destroys treacherous people. 13.6, godliness guards the path of the blameless. Another word for integrity, blameless. Godliness guards the path of the blameless, but the evil are misled by sin. One that I've always loved in Proverbs is in chapter 20, verses 6 and 7. Many will say they are loyal friends, but who can find one who is truly reliable? Look at the next verse. The godly walk with integrity. Blessed are their children who follow them. One of the great benefits of living a life of integrity is your children imbibe the blessings. They have nothing to be ashamed of or afraid of being found out regarding their parents or their grandparents because there has been integrity lived out. One more, if I may, for the sake of time. 28 verse 6. Proverbs 28, 6. Better to be poor and honest than to be dishonest and rich. In his well-known work, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, I found these words of Stephen Covey worth repeating. 
He writes of his being deeply immersed in an in-depth study of the success literature published in the United States since 1776. He says, I was reading or scanning literally hundreds of books, articles, and essays in fields such as self-improvement, popular psychology, and self-help. As my study took me back through 200 years of writing about success, I noticed a startling pattern emerging in the content of the literature. Much of the success literature of the past 50 years, I noticed, was filled with social image consciousness techniques and quick fixes, social band-aids that addressed acute problems and sometimes even appeared to solve them temporarily in stark contrast. Almost all the literature in the first 150 years or so focused on what could be called the character ethic as the foundation of success. Things like integrity, humility, fidelity, temperance, courage, justice, patience, industry, simplicity, modesty, and the golden rule. He concludes, the character ethic taught that there are basic principles of effective living and that people can only experience true success and enduring happiness as they learn and integrate these character ethic principles into their basic character. Allow me a word of personal testimony which I rarely take time for. I am so grateful today that I was raised as I was raised. My brother and my sister and I were reared by a mother and father of enormous character ethic and unswerving integrity. None of this is said in pride. As a matter of fact, uh, I say it in nothing but absolute gratitude. I had nothing to do with the choice of my birth. My wife could say the same thing as she and her sister were reared in a home. None of us had any money. We didn't know we were poor. We just knew that we had enough to eat and there was happiness and there was honesty. I was severely disciplined on a number of occasions because of a lack of such as my mother and dad both were determined to teach this boy integrity. I wasn't grateful for it then. I am very grateful for it now. I deserved much worse than they applied. My sister and my brother would say the same thing. We were reared by people of the greatest generation. I hesitate to use that because it suggests there are no people today who are great. You know better than that. But there was a generation back then that didn't look for handouts, didn't expect applause, didn't do what they would do so that they might make more money or get credit. They did it because it was right. And if you did not do what was right, it was called wrong. It wasn't called poor potty training. It wasn't called misfortune. It was called wrong. Chuck, you reinforced this mission in your letter this month. And I was intrigued by the story you told about
remember the story you told about King Josiah, who took the throne when he was only eight years old. Right, just eight years old, Dave. And his 31-year reign was nothing short of phenomenal. Today, I'm inviting you to be a part of something phenomenal, too. When he was only a teenager, Josiah began seeking the Lord in earnest. And in his 20s, think of it, the man began a campaign to rid his nation of idol worship and godless thinking. There's a touching moment in Josiah's story that unfolds in 2 Chronicles 34. You can read it for yourself. It was actually a turning point in his life, and it was a pivotal event for the people of Judah. While cleaning up a temple, the workers discovered the law of Moses. Josiah had never laid eyes on it before. Think of that. When they unrolled that scroll and read the law of Moses to Josiah, and when he realized that his nation Judah had been out of alignment with God's thinking, Josiah demonstrated his fear and sadness and passion by ripping his clothes in great remorse. That's the equivalent of breaking down in tears and repenting on one's knees before God. Now here's what happened. Josiah's reverence for God's holiness, his commitment to thinking biblically, was used by God to ignite a radical reformation in the entire land of Judah. Yes, that's absolutely phenomenal. Let me draw the simple parallel for you. Our nation, our world, needs women and men like Josiah who think biblically and who in turn begin to act according to God's revealed word. What a difference that makes. That's what Insight for Living Ministries is all about. Equipping listeners like you to read and then revere God's Word as the standard for life. Christians who think biblically are prepared to act biblically. We're at a critical juncture, and your donation this month will make all the difference right here at Insight for Living Ministries. We have embarked on a phenomenal mission to go into all 195 countries for the single purpose of fulfilling the Great Commission of Jesus. Will you be a part of something phenomenal today by making the most generous donation you can afford? Here's how you do it. You can pick up the phone or send a check in the mail, or if you prefer, you can give online. Let's work together to be a part of something absolutely phenomenal. Let's start doing that today. And now, while it's fresh on your mind, please give us a call, go online, or write a letter and respond to Chuck Swindoll. You can give a donation online by going to insight.org. Or call right now. If you're listening in the United States, the number is 1-800-772-8888. As a gesture of our thanks, and as a means for digging deeper into the Proverbs on your own, we'd like to send you the practical and popular book called The Little Red Book of Wisdom. Tuck this into your briefcase and read this while you travel. Or take it on vacation with you. It's highly recommended by Chuck as a simple tool for learning to think biblically. Again, it's called The Little Red Book of Wisdom and comes with our thanks for your donation. If you're listening in the United States, call 1-800-772-8888. Online, go to insight.org.